Hello, and welcome to the Moss Adams presentation of Improved Performance with a Strong Vendor Management Program. Before we get started today, we have just a few tips that will help improve your viewing. So for best, best viewing, close out all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You may adjust placement and window size using the controls in the top right corner of each window or expand the slide view by dragging the lower right corner to resize it. Ask questions today by entering your questions in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. You can download a copy of today's presentation slides or the group CPE attendance sheet from the Slides and Handouts widget to the right of the slide view. If you experience technical difficulty that includes audio or video during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. We'll be asking polling questions throughout today's presentation. Per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy webcast CPE standards, CPE credit will be awarded based on your participation in these polls. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer and click Submit. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions. CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and is not available to participants who view the on-demand version. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet available in the slide deck and handouts widget to receive CPE credit. Please have all group members sign the sheet and please remit only one sheet per group. We'll track your progress and when you have earned your CPE credit, you will click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to download a PDF file to save to your computer. We'll email a copy of your CPE certificate in two weeks if you can't download it today. And finally, as a reminder, today's presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Presenting today is Weston Nelson. Weston has provided financial compliance, inter internal control, and risk management services since 1996. His risk management services include internal audits, Sarbanes-Oxley compliance, process and control analysis, IT compliance and strategy, IT governance, ERP solutions, and anti-bribery. Weston takes a broad-based collaborative approach to risk management, working closely with stakeholders to understand business and compliance risks while developing strategies to improve, remediate, and monitor compliance and risk management efforts. He's led global compliance practices and strategy for multinational companies in the Fortune 100, Big Four, and regional public accounting environments. Weston began his career with a Big Four firm and was most recently the Global Finance Compliance Director for Nike. He previously spent two years at Moss Adams providing business risk management and control solutions, helping clients implement and manage SOX 404 engagements and internal controls over financial reporting. Joining Weston is Brendan Ross. Brendan is a manager with Moss Adams Business Risk Services Group with over six years of public and private accounting and consulting experience. Brendan's experience includes SOC implementations, that's SOC's implementations, internal audits, process analysis and redesign, fraud prevention and detection, and enterprise risk management. He focuses on improving an organization's accounting controls, financial reporting practices, operating effectiveness, and the overall efficiency, as well as addressing regulatory compliance and security. Brendan has led financial, operational, and compliance audits and works on all aspects of the internal audit process. His experience includes first-year implementation and ongoing monitoring under Sarbanes-Oxley, conducting risk assessments, process analysis and re-engineering, segregation of duties analysis, and IT general controls reviews. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Hey, thanks, Tanya. This is uh, this is Brendan here, and uh, thank you, uh, 
Thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you on vendor risk management. Uh, speaking alongside me is Weston Nelson. Uh, so our objectives for today um, really are all specific to vendor risk management. So we're gonna go through, you know, really uh, understanding the environmental norms within a business uh, and your existing IT environment, kind of how vendor risk management plays into that and provide you with considerations relative uh, to your environment, uh, including uh, both operationally and IT. Uh, we're going to also uh, discuss avenues that uh, employees can circumvent uh, uh, vendor risk management controls that are, that are uh, put in place based on your procedures. We're going to discuss how to uh, classify different types of vendors um, at a higher level and really provide considerations for you as you uh, develop your program or make it more robust. We're going to also go through tips for mitigating risk uh, and relative to vendors and improving uh, performance based on vendor type, based on that classification. And really, uh, ultimately, um, implement changes to your vendor management program that improve your partnerships and provide uh, direction for developing strategic vendor relationships uh, for the future. So our agenda today is to really first talk about some of the challenges that vendors pose to an organization, kind of what those risks look like. Uh, we're going to also talk about um, what factors you need to consider when you develop a, a vendor management program. We're going to go through, as we discussed before on the objective slides, uh, what are those environmental norms in your business that you should be considering, regulatory aspects, and what are the best manners to implement a vendor management program. And we're going to also go through uh, the vendor management life cycle by going through vendor due diligence and contracting, uh, vendor risk mitigation, and really maximizing that vendor value, um, and also points to the future on, um, as you'll notice, a, a changing landscape with vendors and, and really to kind of look to the future with your uh, vendor management program. Uh, looks like we have a uh, poll here. Uh, Tanya, turn it back to you. Thanks, Brandon. So again, a reminder, if you're attending and would like to receive CPE, this will be the first of four polling questions. Please provide the best answer. This kind of helps us get an idea of what our audience looks like today. My primary purpose for attending today's learning session is please select the answer that best describes your organization. We have experienced problems with our vendors and are looking for guidance. We're in the process of developing a vendor management program. We are considering updating our existing vendor management program. Or you're attending for CPE or just have a general interest in the topic. I was asked through the Q&A about the slides. If you're looking at the handouts and you don't see the presentation slides today, please press F5 and refresh your system. They are definitely are there. But if you still don't see them, don't worry. Following our broadcast today, we will go ahead and send you a link where you can download them from the cloud. So we'll go ahead and we'll close out our polling question and take a look at the results. Brendan, back to you. All right. Looks like, let's see, the majority of folks have a general interest in the topic, which is which is great. Um, but coming in second, looks like we've also got uh, a quarter of everybody here um, considering updating their existing uh, vendor management program with another 12% uh, in the process of developing a vendor management program. So I think for, for both of these, going to be very, very uh, key guidance here. And then we got that 7% that have, have experienced problems with their vendors and, and are looking for guidance. So we're going to really hit on all, um, all points here um, and, and hopefully help you work through some of those problems in addition to uh, getting the right uh, framework in place at the organization. Well, Weston's going to lead us to, through some of the challenges that uh, we currently face in uh, the vendor management arena. Weston? Yep. Thank you, Brennan. Uh, so as many of you know, a lot of the 
uh, challenges that can be uh, carried on within an organization as it relates to vendor management really stem like the single biggest challenge is that most organizations don't have a defined program. Uh, a lot of this can be lead to uh, a lot of challenges, um, lack of ownership, if you will, within uh, the organization, or clearer defined roles and responsibilities around who should define the program. Some of the other challenges that can exist is oftentimes as organizations grow, their vendor program really grows with them. So over time, they have a large vendor management pool that they're pulling from. And what you'll find, too, in some of the experiences that we've had is that oftentimes some of the challenges can be that every, buy, every uh, employee is a buyer. Uh, so one of the things that we want to really focus on today as we go through the presentation is talking about some of these challenges and how as you step forward with a, as you look to implement a new vendor management program, how you can help avoid some of these common pitfalls. Uh, largely in part developing a defined uh, process for managing vendors, looking at ways to really simplify it. The more complex and challenging the vendor management process becomes uh, can often deter uh, individuals from using that. And what you'll find is that organizations or divisions or groups within the organization will continue to carry on with their existing approach to vendors. Uh, the other challenge that often we see with a lot of organizations is that you're really not maximizing um, the purchasing power of the organization because you have such a large vendor pool. So a lot of these things can lead to uh, ultimately um, some challenges in an effective vendor management effort overall within the organization. What we want to try and do is really balance that effective aspects of managing the risk within the organization, understanding what all those risks are, and then really structuring that against how the organization is used to optimize and improve and add value to the organization. Um, and we'll go through each of those as we go through the next slides uh, as we talk about uh, how we change the landscape and improve the vendor management program. Back to you, Brendan. Thanks, Weston. And, and as Weston, you know, referenced here, and, and this is that there is no one-size-fits-all uh, vendor management program. And really, what what compounds um, the increased risks that vendor or that organizations are facing with their vendors is the increasingly changing landscape of how vendors are utilized uh, within an organization. Um, and so, really think through how. Now, organizations now often will completely outsource critical uh, functions to, to vendors, um, very different than 10, 15 years ago, uh, especially with the increased use of uh, off-site uh, cloud computing, uh, data storage, um, third-party logistics providers, uh, payroll processing. I mean, these are all critical functions that were uh, more traditionally performed in-house and are now being uh, outsourced to vendors. And when we think about uh, when we think about this increased reliance on vendors, um, it brings an increased risk as well, uh, which we'll talk about momentarily. But I, I always often think of how um, you know if a vendor's uh, uh, operations don't align to the values and ethics of the operations of yours, that's sometimes where organizations can fall into trouble. Um, we see this often in the headlines with clothing and technology manufacturers where working conditions of those vendors um, isn't what is represented to the public or what the company um, necessarily uh, values on their side. So it's really important just to think of um, how the landscape has changed and how we now need to manage accordingly to that. Weston's going to talk through just a little bit on how really vendor risk is, is ultimately your organizational risk. Weston? Yep. So, again, as Brendan mentioned, one of the key points is uh, when he's talking about the vendor landscape and how uh, your vendors, uh, when you engage with a vendor, um, how they, the impact that headlines and conditions can have, do they, ex do they represent the same values that the organization does? 
those uh, carry on, those risks that those vendors bring to your organization become your risk and can impact you in a negative way. Uh, there are numerous, uh, as we go through the actions of an organization um, and you look at what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish with your vendor management program, understanding the values that you have and selecting those vendors that espouse those same values is critical to the organization. Uh, and this is a, an important part as we talk about the vendor management program is truly understanding who your vendors are and to some degree, depending on some of the regulatory requirements when we talk about this later on, understanding who your vendors, vendors are can also have a negative impact. So it's important as we go through this that you think about all of these different layers in terms of what it is that your vendors are providing, how they espouse your um, organization policies, and how they represent you is just as important and understanding that in setting up your vendor management program. A lot of times what you'll find is in organizations that you're doing business with, they don't necessarily espouse the same safety protocols, they don't espouse the same uh, operating protocols, uh, they're not necessarily focused on regulatory conformance, um, and ultimately there's some challenges that they may have inconsistency in product quality or product delivery. Uh, so understanding all these elements as we go through and talk about your vendor management program is important. This helps set the frame of what you need to consider as you think about moving and creating a new vendor management program. And with that, uh, we'll flip it over. I think, Tanya, our next polling question is up. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, thank you. So we do have up a polling question now. If you cannot view it, please press F5. You should see a poll that says, in what ways can a vendor disrupt business? And you want to select the radial button next to the best answer for you. Our choices today are nonconformance with regulations, failure to adhere to quality or safety protocols, untimely or inconsistent delivery of services, or all of the above. And we'll give our audience about a further 20 seconds. We have a lot of people on today. We want to make sure and capture as many people as possible to be eligible for CPE. If you've sent a question to our queue uh, in the Q&A. We're holding uh, uh, quite a few questions towards the end, so hopefully we'll, we'll have time to get to your question without going over. And we'll give this just another few seconds, so let's see. And we'll say five, four, three, two, one. And Brendan, you want to take a look at our results? All right. All the above. Okay. We at least got 98% on all the above uh, with a few folks coming in uh, with just uh, uh, one, of the, one of the ways that vendor can disrupt business. Um, but certainly vendor can disrupt your business on, on all of these elements. Um, and while I think through my consulting career and some of my, the client challenges that, that we've worked through, um, there have been multiple instances where vendors disrupted, uh, disrupted business, weren't able to fulfill orders in a timely manner, um, and other areas that um, were disruption to the organization. Yet one of the most uh, critical uh, vendor uh, issues that always sticks out in my mind uh, such as uh, I was preparing for this presentation, was from a healthcare provider that had outsourced a critical function of, of the hospital to a third party. Um, that outsourced provider ended up not following proper safety protocols, and any healthcare uh, individuals on this will, will testament that this is a major compliance area and a concern for anybody. Um, and so they didn't, uh, they didn't adhere to safety protocols. And not only um, did it have a reputational impact to the healthcare provider, um, because it did make the news that folks were um, exposed to unsafe conditions, patients were exposed to unsafe conditions, but it also put people's lives at risk. 
because of um, because of the lack of oversight and management of that vendor. Um, so while not all organizations are going to face life or death decisions with their vendors, it's important to not underestimate how much a vendor can impact your business, its reputation, and ultimately your customers, your patients, and those and, and people. So for the next part of this segment, uh, or this, this presentation, we're going to talk about the vendor management uh, life cycle here. And it's pretty simple from a uh, framework perspective. So we're really going to first discuss establishing that uh, vendor management program, what does that look like? And as we discussed before, it's, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all uh, view, but it's really considerations uh, to take into account as you establish your, your program or, for many of you, um, update your existing program. Then we're going to go through the actual specifics of that program, um, starting with vendor selection, uh, going through to procurement and contracting, and then that, that risk management, that monitoring, that performance improvement piece on the back end. We'll first start with establishing a vendor management program. And really when we think of creating a vendor management program, it's imperative that your program isn't too rigid or too complex important that it's basic enough that individuals will follow your program. And it needs to be specific to your organization. And it goes back to that not one size fits all. There is no standards on managing vendors. All right, so when you think of challenges, um, we want the program to be effective, but it needs to be efficient. And if it's not efficient, um, it's going to increase the chance of workarounds. Um, workarounds including um, if, you know, from an IT perspective, and we'll talk about environment in, in a moment, uh, but can folks circumvent controls that you have, right, based on your IT environment? Um, from a centralization perspective, this is key. Centralization of your vendors creates efficiencies and often create, uh, create synergies um, as you'll have a uh, better view of the vendors in your organization, the services they provide, and um, really making sure that you're only, you know, you're maximizing the dollar spend per vendor and that you're not duplicating vendors on providing the same service. Um, and also, you know, we think about from just a synergy perspective, things such as aligning AP to um, procurement um, or to the buying function. These are ways that um, you can create a centralized uh, vendor management program or just considerations to think through as you create that program. As we discussed before, it's critical to understand your internal IT structure. What does your ERP system look like? Um, and what does that external environment look like as well that your organization environment's in? Um, your vendor management program needs to fit as best as possible into your organization's overall control structure for it to be effective. When we think through environmental considerations, and this is again at creating the program level, um, you really want to think through how does your competition operate? What are those industry norms, kind of back to the beginning? That's important to note. Um, what are the geographies that you and your vendors operate in? We're going to talk about regulatory aspects in a moment. That's going to uh, fold right into that, and it folds into FCPA as well. And as Weston mentioned before, really critical to understand as you create the program who is considered a buyer and who's really able to procure uh, vendor services in your organization, whether that's through um, your ERP system, that's through your formal uh, EO processing system or contracting uh, system, or if they're able to circumvent those controls. Um, and so when I think of that ability to circumvent controls, if I think back to clients where they had a proper uh, contracting process um, that was rigid, 
perhaps too rigid, and individuals uh, often then were just using emails to procure services, therefore circumventing the controls in place. So, so it's really a matter of building a program that fits the environment that you have now so that individuals will be much more likely to embrace it and to use it, which we'll talk a little bit more about on implementations as well. Really understanding who owns that vendor and is therefore accountable to your vendor. It's really important that there is that single line of ownership. Question? Going on to environmental considerations, I think this is the important piece. So as Brendan has mentioned, there's a lot of things that we, uh, as you consider the regulatory requirements, as you think about the environmental consideration, all of these have an impact on the organization and how they can influence the program. And as we talked about, keeping it simple is really important. And this is where we've run into, we've seen experiences within organizations where the more you consider your environment, the more you consider your regulatory requirements, you can overcomplicate or in, in create a program that really does become onerous in the effort. Uh, so being mindful of your environment and also understanding internally how your different groups, your business service lines work together is important. And then pulling that back and linking that into your overall considerations as it relates to regulatory requirements. So as we think, we're going to talk about this as we move forward, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into the next slide, um, when we focus on regulatory considerations. Um, this is where you really need to factor in all of the elements as it relates to what your service line is and how those regulatory considerations, whether or not you're public. Uh, if you're public, you've got Sarbanes-Oxley. Does my Sarbanes-Oxley controls really address FC, uh, some of my other requirements? If I have international locations, do I have Foreign Corrupt Practice Act? Uh, in those international locations, do I have anti-bribery, anti-corruption considerations? Other things to consider, Dodd-Frank. Um, and when you look at all of these elements, it's really understanding all of the requirements together and looking at the impact that they would have overall. Um, and really driving those considerations as part of helping you put and gather input into your management program. As we step through the next steps, I'm going to hand it over to Brendan. I, we've covered a little bit on these regulatory considerations and talked about them at a high level. But ultimately, this is where it's really critical. If you think about a lot of the news and the information that's out there today, a lot of this can have a negative and an adverse impact on your organization. If you truly don't understand your vendors, the consequences can be pretty severe. And we've seen some of those historically in the past. Um, when the regulatory considerations aren't factored into how you use your vendors and manage your vendors within the organization. Thanks, Wes. Really, Wes did a great job of outlining some of those key regulatory considerations to think through um, and the key acts to think through, but certainly the list goes on um, in your uh, current business environment. It's really important to think through um, what type of work your vendor is going to be doing, and also the type of data that they receive and retain, uh, especially um, now that there is so much scrutiny over, um, you know, the various forms of private, customer, patient, uh, you know, uh, information, right? So it's really important to, to remember that, you know, if Vendor data breaches uh, can can greatly uh, impact your organization, um, and not only in a regulatory uh, manner, but the reputational as well. Um, so, so here's you know certainly a list of different um, different acts to be cognizant of. Obviously, FCTA is very important for companies who operate abroad or whose vendors' operations occur abroad. Uh, Dodd Frank. 
this is one where it's a, a thought through of not only who are your vendors, but who are the vendors of your vendors. And, and the example here is you outsource uh, your data hosting uh, to somebody else, or you give, let's say actually better yet, you give data um, to a vendor and they outsource their data hosting, that outsource is now your risk. Um, and it's, so it's really important to not only understand the, the data going to vendors, but really where, what are they doing with that data um, and who else is receiving it because the, the, the chain continues and the risk still funnels back to uh, your organization um, in that flow. One of obviously most critical pieces of you know, taking a vendor man management program and uh, actually uh, getting it to, to work in your organization is implementation. So we've given you different considerations as you define that framework. But one of the biggest considerations, you know, prior to implementation is really soliciting feedback from your buyers and all your stakeholders that will be impacted um, as you implement this program. Think through what are those barriers to being successful. Um, back to that PO example, you know, if it's too complex uh, to follow uh, the, the framework that you implemented, are individual just going to go around, and is everybody, you know, is our folks going to continue to operate the way they did before? Really key, and it's really key to get the buy-in from stakeholders, from buyers, for them to see the value. Um, in in the program, right? so it goes it goes through communicating your your classic change management uh, functions, but communication, training, policies. But again, it's that buy-in that's going to make it successful. It's also critical, uh, provided the changing environmental uh, environment of vendors, a changing regulatory landscape, um, and just the rate of change many organizations themselves face is scalability and flexibility in your program that can involve the needs of your business. And, and I think when we, we talk about getting folks on board to a efficient and effective vendor management program, centralizing that program will really help them to see that um, because it'll help individuals to maximize the value that they receive uh, from, from the various vendors that they, that they utilize. Let's and I think, talk yeah. Go ahead, Wes. No, I, would, I think it's really one of the things, and Brendan brought up a really good point. It's important where we see a lot of organizations as we go through this, setting at having the right visibility at the at the right level is critical. Um, and I, I think you know, oftentimes you'll hear kind of where is it from tone at the top. If this is a process that gets embedded too far down within the organization, it's not going to be successful. So it really is critical to make sure that you've got the right leadership and stakeholders in place at the right level that can drive it through the organization. And that really does stem all the way up to the C-suite and making sure that there is accountability and ownership for this program to be successful. Uh, I think, you know, as you look at the implement, as you consider implementing it, understanding that is really critical to help the success of the program as a whole and having that right leadership in place to break down barriers to help support the program and the effort is a key component when you think about implementing. So don't underestimate that effort or the time in finding the right leadership, and don't underestimate the time when, it, when we consider just the change management aspect and how you know, an organization, if you have an organization where everybody's a buyer and that's changing, understand the impact that can have on your different groups. Back to you, Brandon. Sorry. Thanks, Good point to highlight. We've got another polling question here. Tanya? Yes, these are my favorite. So this is the third of our polling questions today. And you should see which of these elements does not contribute to a successful vendor management program. Is it buy-in and support from company leadership, centralization of vendor oversight where plausible, reliance on contracts that have built-in renewal clauses, or identifying critical risks? Good 
give everybody just a, a few seconds, maybe another 15 seconds, to go ahead and be sure and get their answers submitted. If you're having any difficulty seeing the polling question, please press F5 to refresh. And and before we go ahead and close that out, go ahead. Oh. Oh, go. That's okay. Go ahead. We'll go ahead and take a look at our results. Thanks, Brendan. All right. So um, it looks like the majority of folks, this is a bit of a trick question just because we haven't quite gotten to uh, the contract piece, but I like where everybody's uh, thoughts are. Um, what does not contribute, right, um, to successful? Uh, I mean, buy-in is critical, definitely is, um, is, is critical to success. Um, so I'm glad most folks didn't choose that one, uh, that 3%. 4% said centralization isn't important. Um, I, I, would, I would argue otherwise um, just because it does provide a view of all your vendors and it provides efficiency um, and understanding what vendors do and making sure you don't have vendors doing the same activities for varying levels of quality and price. Um, and then another small portion said identifying uh, critical risks. Uh, this also is is a very important part because of, of, of establishing uh, a vendor management program because you need to understand kind of what those barriers are. If barriers exist and they're not resolved, it's not going to be implemented properly. Um, most folks, about 90% or 89.4 here, did go with uh, reliance on contracts that have built-in renewal clauses. Um, that does not assist um, in a successful vendor management program. But we'll talk about that in a little bit um, when we go through contract management and just really uh, avoiding the use of evergreen clauses in contracts. So moving, you know, moving through the vendor management cycle, we talked about considerations on really you know, how to establish your vendor management program. And so now we're going to go through just how does vendor selection look like? When I think of vendor evaluation and vendor selection, it's, it's really important to start um, with, you know, some form of risk assessment. Really then drive how you can categorize your different vendors. Um, through that, that'll help you identify, you know, which type of mitigation activity you need to put in place for higher risk vendors. And the example is here is that, you know, a vendor that provides janitorial services is typically going to have less risk associated with it than a vendor that you know, provides data hosting services. Or a vendor that is, let's say, your third-party logistics provider and your manufacturer. Those present major risks to your organization. Uh, but the, the key here, and back to being it, the, the program, including evaluation all aspects being specific to your organization and the environment of your organization is that if that same janitorial service was performing clean room uh, services at a pharmaceutical company, that would present, present much greater risk than, you know, a typical janitorial service. So it's really key to think critical through who those vendors are, the services they provide, um, and, and the environment that they operate within. You know, and so really these risk considerations um, stretch across the board and comes back to that vendor risk is, is really your organization's risk. Um, so you think through just reputation. Um, how, how, can a, how could a vendor's poor performance negatively impact uh, your reputation? Or better yet, uh, on a positive note, how could their, their good performance um, assist? Um, in your reputation and assist in the, the growth of your organization. Um, also need to be considering how much, obviously, how much money is involved in the vendor relationship. Make sure that you're putting the right emphasis and focus on a larger dollar, higher risk organizations. IT is very key. Understanding what type of data the vendor is going to receive, what are they going to do with that data, is someone else, back to the Dodd-Frank example, um, are, is that data going to be then 
um, retained by another third party um, because that's how that vendor is set up and that's how their data um, storage is set up. All these considerations need to be factored in as you go through evaluating different vendors and the risks that they present to your organization. And of course, back to FCPA and geographies, it's really important to know uh, geographies that you operate within and, and the vendor does as well. No, and that's a good point, Brendan. When you think about this, the environmental challenges that we spoke about earlier and the regulatory requirements are really important when you consider your vendor evaluation. Uh, we've seen examples where there is a vendor evaluation at, that goes on within organizations, um, but as they consider uh, FCPA, as they consider other regulatory requirements, the vendor program wasn't meeting those needs and didn't go to the right level. So important that you factor in in this part when you're considering your vendors. And this may be something that, as you talk about from an implementing standpoint, that you may need to start to bucket your vendors into different groups that highlight the risk as it relates to your regulatory requirements. So as you go through, as Brendan mentioned, oftentimes a lot of like your examples where you have your janitorial services, that may be a lower risk and certainly requires less attention per se than perhaps someone who is really focused on delivering product or goods and that product and good or has an impact in a foreign location and could have an adverse impact as it relates to either anti-bribery, anti-corruption laws that exist out there or FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act. So be mindful of that as you go through your vendor evaluation that you may need to create buckets to help manage the risk as you go through the process of implementing this effort. And then, then we think of, you know, provide that. Thanks, Weston. Um, how, how do we, what are some techniques for actually mitigating uh, vendor risk um, in advance of procuring and advance of contracting? So really due diligence is critical. Um, and, and really it's a matter of understanding your vendors and the services they're gonna provide. These are just some examples of proper due diligence to perform on vendors ahead of time, but it is, it's imperative, especially for these high-risk vendors, to review financial stability, to, you know, meet with, if possible, vendor references, to have a competitive bidding process so you, you can maximize the value from your vendors. And this, the cross-functional involvement is really important as you go through the um, uh, pre-procurement, procurement cycles, so that everybody's on board with how the vendor is being managed up front before contracting. Um, and another way of, of also just assessing risk is, is using questionnaires. I know a lot of organizations that have extremely lengthy ones that they then tailor based on the risk type um, of that vendor um, to get a better idea of you know, what, what are the risks the vendor uh, presents and how can we um, best mitigate those and be aware of those in advance um, of, of procuring services from that vendor. Leads us to our next polling question. Anya? Yes, thank you. Our fourth and final polling question. So a company wishing to improve the quality of their vendor management program and minimize their risk exposures should classify vendors into risk and geography categories, then identify appropriate procedures to manage the various classifications, or ensure their vendor due diligence process is updated to be thorough and accurate, uses built-in risk detection methods, and involves multiple stakeholders, or identify specific regulatory requirements they are subject to and ensure all vendors are compliant with these regulations. Consider the use of a consultant that specializes in performing risk assessments to provide non-biased insight into policies and procedures, or all of the above. Again, we're looking for wishing to improve the quality of your vendor management program oh, and minimize their risk exposures. So we'll clock this out. We'll give it maybe another five seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. And Brendan, we'll take a look at the results. Great. 
Oh, we still got a couple folks uh, um, who, who just chose um, just chose you know classifying vendors. Definitely important. Um, ensuring proper due diligence also important. Um, uh, no one chose just using a consultant, uh, but majority vast majority here folks uh, chose all of the above. They are all um, definitely critically important to really minimizing risk, risk exposure and maximizing uh, the quality and the value that, that's derived from your vendors. Now we're going to go through uh, the next piece, which is really procurement and contract uh, management book selection. This one's a bit, bit more straightforward. Um, really on the fact that, you know, based on that vendor risk assessment, the form of your agreement is really gonna is gonna be a byproduct of that. So for for high risk vendors, certainly recommend uh, contracts to be used. Um, and to avoid back to the polling question, uh, I think there's polling question number three, to avoid those evergreen clauses that you can perform periodic evaluations, that you can perform uh, bidding on services as needed. Um, and then with those contracts, we'll talk about this a little bit more in monitoring, but developing in service level agreements that have penalties for non-conformance, but also value proposi proposition for exceeding standards. So it's really going you know, to build a contract, kind of building it right and uh, making sure that within that contract that you have proper uh, management procedures or vendor management procedures in place that you really can hold the vendor accountable uh, to provide the best value for your organization. Now, uh, short-term services that have limited impact the organization, um, you know, often see uh, purchase orders used. It's just important to make sure that there is um, that there's structure and rigor in deciding if a contract will be used versus a purchase order. And of course, it is important to have authorization matrices. Um, and processes that are clear and properly communicated uh, for buyers to follow so that individuals will actually follow those procedures. And while this, this slide specifically speaks to the operational piece, when we think about the centralization of, of contracts, um, not only will it help you understand who your vendors are and making sure that you're getting the most value and not duplicating uh, vendors to provide the same service, services. It will also assist from an accounting perspective, understanding what your outstanding, you know, vendor rules are um, on, a, on a monthly basis. And I know this is something that a lot of organizations struggle with is just getting a grasp on your contract. So the more that there is centralization, the easier it will be to uh, the easier it will be to really properly. Um, Count for those financially, and to maximize value operationally. And next, we're going to go through uh, risk management and monitoring, which is which is really kind of the end piece of the life cycle, um, but is I, I can't say the most important, but it's 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 critically important. So when we think of you know uh, risk management um, and and monitoring of of vendors, uh, the the key here is you know going back to contracting that um, you, if you have service level agreements, you want to have those um, in your contract so you can hold vendors accountable to um, to the agreement um, that you can audit their deliverables um, as needed, that you can continue to perform due diligence on vendors um, throughout the process so that if that risk category changes, if what that vendor is providing or the data you provide changes, that you can update your uh, risk management procedures as needed. Um, and it's really this clear alignment between uh, business owners to vendors so that someone's accountable, responsible for that vendor. And from a strategic perspective, um, it's often best practice uh, to have periodic business reviews with um, uh, with your critical vendors, align on what's going well, what's what needs to be improved, 
and really building um, that partnership with your vendors going forward. And I think key to this too is just making sure that when you talk about from a monitoring standpoint, the continuous, as Brendan mentioned, revisiting your vendors, the ultimate goal is to maximize uh, the value to the organization through either purchasing power, or centralizing those vendors. So going through on a regular basis and trying to maintain as low as possible uh, a vendor group is pretty key in this effort and understanding where you're getting the best value in the program and how can then you leverage and maximize that purchasing power within the organization to help you do that. So don't underestimate the time it takes, but uh, make sure that it does get included, that you're taking a regular review through your vendors, assessing them, evaluating them, and scoring them to see whether or not they're vendors that you would like to continue to work with. Thanks, Boston. So we're going to cruise um, through a little bit these last couple slides. I'd love to get um, get to a couple of the, the questions um, here. Um, but, you know, looking ahead, you know, looking at it from a vendor management perspective, um, flexibility with your vendors is, is key. Um, so back to that evergreen comment, avoid rigid agreements. You know, make sure that you can, your vendor can pivot with, uh, with your organization as your organization evolves. Um, and think strategically. You know, we think of partnering with vendors that have similar um, long-term visions as your organizations, partnering with vendors that provide synergies um, when you both work together. As you, and we, we see this a lot more um, commonplace um, in today's business environment. It's just important to remember that, especially with partnerships, um, that that organization aligns with um, that organization's values and operations align with how you want to be perceived in your organization as well. So while partnerships um, can provide tremendous value to your organization, um, it's, it's important just make sure that you're choosing wisely and, of course, that you have the flexibility in your agreements to change as your business evolves. And, and wrapping up today for, for key takeaways, really want to make sure that your vendor management program is, is tailored to the, the needs of your organization, to the, or, the, the environment that your organization operates within, um, so that you can create a program that's effective yet efficient at the same time. Um, and each vendor is going to be unique on how they're um, specifically on how they're managed, but it's really you know, key in um, making sure that they're bucketed into certain categories so that you have guidelines on how to properly assess vendors, what the risks they present are, and how to manage them appropriately. Um, and obviously, we've talked about a couple times here, I mean, the, the success and failures of your vendors are going to impact your organization. Um, they can impact significantly. So you really don't want to underestimate the risks and the benefits associated with, um, with vendor relationships. So we want to thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you, Brendan and Weston. We appreciate the information and suggestions provided. There was a lot of useful and readily applicable information. We've got time now for just a, a couple of the questions. So uh, let's see. One is, how can service level agreements be integrated into vendor performance measures? And it's two parts. So how can an organization develop and implement vendor performance measures or guarantees? Weston, you want to tackle that one? Uh, yeah, I, can do, I think that this really depends um, on what, again, it depends on specific to your environment and what you're looking at. I think this is one where when you're looking at service level agreements and understanding when you set up your vendor performance measures or KPIs, what is it that you use to track and is there common knowledge with the vendor on what you're trying to do or organize? Uh, I think the more aligned you are on those performance measures and how you track them, those key performance indicators are really important. And it needs to be a collaboration between you and the vendor so that it's clear that expectations are aligned. 
Um, and then I think that it really does come down to there's an element where the organization does have to spend the time to monitor and manage those service level arrangements um, and to see how successful they are. To the extent that you have a contract, and I'll try and answer this other part with a guarantee, because um, that one can get a little tricky, uh, but I think I would apply it in a very similar fashion that you establish those key performance indicators or measurements up front and that there's a certain threshold that must be driven or met in order to guarantee certain conditions. And without knowing a lot of the circumstances, and I am happy to take the, a more detailed question offline, I think it really does come back to understanding and collaborating with your vendors in an effective way to really set up those KPIs and service level agreement conditions. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see, so I've got, I've got two questions, and I think they're kind of asking the same thing. So um, one says, from a banking standpoint, we're subject to a lot of regulation and changing regulation. Are you aware of a specific software or IT solution that can help manage this type of vendor environment? And then the similar question is, you referenced that there's not a single set of rules or guidance for helping manage vendors. Is there a tool or program that can effectively help with this? It I can, I can, Brandon, I can kind of tee this one up. I mean, there's a lot of tools out there that are available, and I think it really does, um, we're, I think it, to me, it really does come down to process people and then tools. So it's important that you understand the process and what you're trying to establish within your organization, the people then, how they're going to use that. I always kind of think of things in terms of, you know, there's a lot of tools that can help create the efficiency and improve the effectiveness and the monitoring and help make that important. But for me, it's really first and foremost understanding the process and what you're trying to drive. So really initiating a strong vendor management program, how you want to implement that, developing, as we've talked about in, through the discussion, those internal controls. And then you could look at the tools that best fit your need within the organization. And so that, that that's my recommendation. I usually think of it in terms of that process, people, and then tools to come back to the way I want those processes to work. And that, that works for regulation as well, is that correct? Correct. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, regulation is just another, I mean, you're, when you consider your process, your process needs to include those regulatory requirements. Nice, nice. Um, let's see, so we've got time for one more. Um, can you give an example of an evergreen contract? Brendan, I'll, I'll, Brendan you want to? Great. Okay. So, uh, well, I guess the, the question is uh, if it's necessarily interpretation of what evergreen contract means. But, um, but evergreen contracts are ones that basically state that um, you know, every X amount of years the contract automatically renews. I come across this a fair amount at uh, my, my clients um, that have legacy contracts that literally it stayed in the contract, they auto renew every, you know, two to five years, let's say. Um, and just the risk associated with auto renewing contracts is that it, it provides that much less visibility to, um, or natural visibility to look at the contract and to uh, assess the vendor. Um, and what, what, I, what I've found is that Vendors that are under evergreen contracts are not assessed with the same scrutiny um, because they're never up for contract review um, and, and they just roll forward uh, at the original agreement that um, was, was crafted years prior. Wow. Wow. So, again, thank you everyone for joining us. If you have questions about your vendor management program that we didn't cover today or that there are, you, are unique to your organization, please don't hesitate to contact either Brendan or Weston. So thank you, gentlemen, for presenting today. And finally, please take a minute to complete a brief survey to tell us how we did how we can improve, and provide your input to our ongoing webinar series. If you're attending live and met the NASBA requirements for CPE, you may download your certificate at this time. 
If the webinar stops prior to your download, you may go back into the console and print your certificate after our broadcast concludes. Again, thank you for joining us.